So uh, thanks everyone. My name is Brian Courtney, and uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be able to moderate this next session. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, the title for this session is Government Strategy to Accelerate Innovation, and I, I we debated a little bit in terms of um, how to put this uh, section together, um, because uh, you know bringing actual government people who are actively in office or, or or running for office is a little bit of a trick, and the people that work in the direct bureaucratic arms of the government, such as the Ministry of Health or um, Ministry of um, Innovation, Science and Economic Development. Uh, it gets a bit tricky to bring them in, um, uh, in part because they're incredibly overwhelmed with managing coronavirus, in part because you know, there are rules of engagement in terms of how they, um, they can uh, come into these sorts of events. But you know, <clears throat> one of the things that I spent a fair amount of time talking about um, and, and um, trying to amass resources um, and create some uh, cohesion in the med tech sector uh, within Canada um, definitely does involve government. Uh, we have a single payer healthcare system. Uh, so government has an incredibly important role from that perspective. Uh, there's the regulatory aspects uh, uh, in terms of how government interplays with the med tech sector. We've been fortunate to have people from Health Canada um, participate in our events in the past. Uh, and I have to, you know, just give a little bit of congratulations to the people at Health Canada that have had to work very hard over the course of the past eight months um, to help manage the COVID pandemic. Um, fortunately, they were able to, to get some resources and almost double the size of their medical device evaluation group just before COVID happened. So that was um, really helpful. Government has really important roles in research and development. And in supporting commercialization, you just heard um, Ed Harvey uh, talk a bit about how they've expanded four clean rooms in Montreal. Um, I, I can only strongly suspect there's been some government money to help with some of the expansion, at least some points along the roll for Mayo uh, One. Uh, and uh, Quebec has really strong programs to encourage medical technology investment. But one area that I think would really, um, we really haven't cracked the nut on in Canadian med tech is um, the revenue part of med tech. How do you get it to the point where if you come up with a new technology, it's good for patients, it should be good for healthcare, should be good for physicians. How do you get it such that the system recognizes that and actually pays for the technology? How, where's the reimbursement aspect of it? And whether that's reimbursement for the hospitals or the clinics buying a technology, or whether it's reimbursement for physicians actually using a technology during their procedures or other aspects of their clinical care, is a really important and complicated topic with a lot of inertia. So when we put this session together, we were thinking about um, who are some of the key speakers that might have experience in this area, provide some insights in terms of where the barriers are and where the opportunities are. And I think um, the people that we've put together are really uh, strong uh, people for this. And so um, our first speaker is gonna be Andy Smith, the CEO of Sunnybrook. The next one's gonna be our president of the Ontario Medical Association, Dr. Samantha Hill. And then uh, a world expert in um, health uh, economics and clinical epidemiology, uh, a cardiologist uh, from the United States, Dr. Barron will also be joining us. So I'm gonna um, introduce Dr. Smith uh, as uh, our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Smith uh, is our CEO here at Sunnybrook. He um, trained at Sloan Kettering for uh, surgical oncology, um, has been involved in a number of uh, interactions between uh, the hospital and uh, government. And he's been a very strong proponent since becoming the CEO and even prior to becoming the CEO um, at Sunnybrook in terms of uh, uh, growing the uh, med tech innovation um, uh, space, uh, trying to help adapt how Sunnybrook as well as other parts of the healthcare system in Canada operate to really support innovation so that we improve care for our patients at our hospital, but also have the opportunity to um, have impact uh, at a national and international level. And it's a real privilege to um, have, have Andy uh, um, support us, um, be involved and, and really help move, uh, move this uh, area forward. So without saying much more than that, I'm gonna uh, let Andy uh, take things from here and uh, look forward to his presentation. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. 
Perfect. So thanks, Brian and Ahmed, and to all of the uh, organizers for uh, inviting me. As I was listening to you introduce this part of the program and talking about things like inertia and barriers uh, and so forth, I hope this is not the downer section. Rather, I'm going to say right up uh, front, I hope that my uh, uh, remarks combined with the others uh, help to fuel the optimism of the attendees here today, uh, because that's fully the intent and I believe fully a reflection of the reality and the uh, opportunity in front of us. Uh, as CEO of Sunnybrook, I feel extremely strongly that this is a, a moment in time, pandemic or not, and, and maybe frankly enhanced by the pandemic, that we have uh, more opportunity than ever before to get a coordinated uh, uh, approach to getting better at uh, taking ideas through to uh, positive impact on patients and their families the health system and our uh, economics uh, in our terrific country of Canada. So um, here's uh, the uh, key takeaways that I'd like you to think about as we're going through my remarks. So first of all, this thing in the box at the top, uh, this is a slide that goes in my brain all the time, uh, and it's uh, right or wrong. I, I'm just putting it out there. These are personal remarks I'm making here from the perspective of a, of a healthcare executive. Um, the, the, you know, Sunnybrook's a $1.1 billion organization, and that's the taxpayer's money. There's no question that uh, one of the things that constantly pops into my mind, I don't see it as a barrier, uh, but I do see it as an important prism. That is that value is quality uh, uh, times the patient's experience and uh, divided by the health system cost. So I think about that uh, quasi equation uh, all the time as I go through my, uh, through my life. So, so here's the thing. So we definitely, I'm a doctor at heart. Uh, you can never stop being a doctor. I never intended to be a hospital CEO. Uh, so first and foremost, we need, we absolutely need better solutions for the treatment of disease. And that's why this is, uh, to my mind, the most incredible sector to be involved in of, uh, you know, spend our days on this uh, earth and in terms of our human endeavor. We've got to have bigger impact on patients' disease. And by the way, they want impact on disease. They want it to, to be removed from them and they want less and less impact on their body. The less impact, the better. And that's what we'd all want personally and for our family. But at the same time, understandably, they pay the bills and uh, we've got to be, whether it's a long-term view, there has to be constant line of sight as to how can we bring this uh, future forward but reducing healthcare costs. And bullet three, I think is a bit newer with respect to how uh, we think about things in the healthcare sector, this public sector, but I expect our organization and our teams and our people to be uh, thinking that they will, with confidence, enrich our innovation economy in Canada. Because if not us, who? There's an incredible uh, constellation of great uh, uh, people, great resources and organizations like ours with partners. And that's what we should expect of ourselves. We all know, and the reason this is a, a topic today is that uh, it's hard work, but uh, persist. I think that uh, persistence is critical and there are lots of examples of success that uh, come forward. So this is really important. I agree, I, I'm an expert in uh, no specific as aspect here, but as I look at it all from 10,000 feet and think about it uh, more and more, uh, there's no question that many of the steps are uh, opaque. And yes, they are regulatory and fiscal barriers that need to be navigated, but we need to get better at uh, doing that as a team. And that brings me to the third point, it's a team sport. Um, uh, you know, the idea of getting people in the room, whether it's electronic or, uh, or um, uh, in person, uh, really sounds really basic, but it's a step that gets omitted a lot of times that could uh, really help navigate uh, 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 barriers or uh, get to a faster path to progress if we have excellent collaboration at all stages. So uh, here's a, um, a quote from Steve Jobs that uh, uh, probably many people have seen. Steve Jobs is commonly quoted. But I think it's important the hospital CEO thinks about, okay, what's our strategy and what are we about? Well, Sunnybrook's vision is to invent the future of healthcare. That's been our vision for a long time. And when I was a doctor, I didn't know the difference between a vision and a mission and didn't really think about it that much. But I'll tell you, as a hospital CEO, I think about it every day, multiple times a day. And the fact is we are dedicated to building a team and investing in a team that wants to invest, invent the future of healthcare. If not us, who to help make things better for healthcare for Canadians. And uh, so the diagram uh, on the left, the figure is our strategic plan and extremely brief. I'm not gonna go through it, but I do wanna say that our, for, uh, uh, for example, the first strategic direction there, number one, strategic direction number one, 
develop personalized and precise treatments that, uh, and, and this really hits at types of therapies that deliver on that value I talked about. So better quality care, it's the patient has less impact on their body. And by the way, ultimately we can see how it would cost less. And I'll talk a bit about that. So the picture on the right is the example I'm gonna to refer to probably most in my uh, uh, examples as we go through it. It's focused ultrasound uh, as an approach for what we've called here incision free neuros uh, neurosurgery guided by uh, um, uh, MR imaging and uh, MR thermometry. So that picture may be recognizable to many. That's Dr. Nir Lipsman at the, I believe the first patient that uh, underwent this treatment for tremor uh, 2012. So Dr. Lipsman was just uh, honored as one of the top 40 under 40 in Canada in the last week or so. I think this is when it must have been shortly after his 30th birthday and you'll notice a head of hair there devoid of any grays whatsoever. Um, so uh, why is focused ultrasound for um, uh, tremor or for uh, other diseases of the brain and mind uh, so terrific? Why does it produce value? Going back to that equation I put at the outset. Well, first of all, high quality clinical care. It's got to work and it does work and it'll work uh, uh, for a wider range of applications. Uh, in this case, uh, the one that's well established and we have lots of experience, uh, uh, medically refractory tremor. Secondly, uh, it's never been, it's always should have been uh, right at the top of the list, but it's never been more important now and focused on uh, It looks like we just lost connection there. We're going to wait just a minute to see if this comes back. Ahmed or Graham, are you hearing anything? Uh, no, Brian, I think we lost Andy. Um, yep. Just sent a quick text. So. Thanks. I was tough at an innovation course when innovation doesn't go right. Yeah. Never have more trouble with engineering problems. Decide how much engineering. you're going to invest in Zoom. <laughs> oh. Andy? Hello? This is where we need a uh, background for technical difficulties. Please stand by. He's coming on. I just uh, got the quick word. Otherwise, we'll do it through my telephone. <laughs> okay. Just while we're waiting here, there are two questions that came in on the Q&A that I'll give some early answers to. One was um, how long it takes to go from an investigational testing authorization to a health technology assessment approval. There are a lot of devices or technologies that um, go from their uh, initial investigational testing and they never get approved through a health technology assessment. Uh, and that, that's probably more common than not. So one answer might be in perpetuity. Um, Others, you know, really fast ones. Um, I don't, probably the right person to answer that question might even be Dr. Weejay Sundara, if he's uh, on, um, on our call, but uh, he, it, I, I'm going to ballpark it at about five years. It takes a long time to go through that to build up the knowledge base, and it really depends on what the other data that's out there is that is available to support that particular technology. Um, 
There was another question here with respect to some of the um, COVID Emergency Response Act and IP rights um, in terms of a question to say, hey, is there is it okay to waive patents or to push patents off to the side when you're in the midst of a medical emergency? And I think that probably is the right thing to do. Um, you know, patents are meant to uh, uh, protect people and innovators, inventions, but when you have a lot of lives on the line or a very strong social agenda, that truly Sorry. is an emergency. Seems a reasonable thing to do. And they actually foresee that in the patent, um, in the patent uh, 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 laws uh, that um, waiving intellectual property rights in those circumstances is quite reasonable to do. So um, that's how I feel about it. I don't know uh, while we're waiting for Andy, it looks like Andy's about to get set up and started again here. Uh, so, uh, can you hear me? There, <laughs> can you hear me? Yep, we, see, we see and we hear you. Great. Not sure where the feedback is coming from, but there, there we go. So um, I will go back to screen share. I have had once in a while power go off in an operating room. I think it's actually a um, bit more of a challenge when it happens when you're doing in the middle of a Zoom presentation. So uh, live and learn. And um, let me get back to where we were. Um, so. I was getting really excited about why this is great for, uh, for uh, you know, improved patient experience because it's less invasive. If you can tell a patient and their family, we're going to fix your problem in the brain. And by the way, we don't have to open your skull. That's obviously better. And then finally, and this is going to be one I'm going to really oversimplify it, but I think the message is important. Uh, resource utilization, it's crystal clear where you can see the pathway, how this can be better. And I've bolded the uh, single night stay. It's an oversimplification, but it's an important simplification to remember and to emphasize. All advances in healthcare, if you can do interventions to improve disease and you can have either no nights over uh, in the hospital or you can reduce the number of nights in the hospital, that is a really clear sign that you're onto a winner. So what's the pathway then? How do we move it along from a great idea uh, and then all the way through to the uh, point where we're having an impact uh, in the hospital on a large scale that's scoping and scaling and that it is uh, also enriching the economy. So this uh, parable is uh, well known to I think everybody. Basically, I think that many of us have a really uh, a good assessment of what's going on, but it's a limited view in that we don't see the big picture. If I was on this, um, uh, picture here. I'd probably be out here. I'm not touching the elephant at all uh, and uh, similarly have the blindfold on but do have a, uh, a, a sense as to what we're uh, looking for. So it all starts as everybody in this room knows with great science. So if it's there's not great science behind something honestly that's a step where uh, uh, really it's going to be a, a tough road to hoe. You do have to uh, uh, remember that things are never perfect and science continues to evolve but using the example of uh, focused ultrasound uh, for essential tremor uh, there's no question that uh, uh, we're blessed with having great scientists such as Dr. Lipsman, uh, Dr. Kulavo Hinnanen and their, and their terrific teams and collaborators around the world but the fact of the matter is there's a uh, great peer-reviewed science that shows that uh, the basic idea, the basic science behind the uh, healthcare innovation is uh, solid. So uh, getting papers and grants for that is certainly uh, old hat, frankly, for uh, universities and academic health science centers. It they're really are the metrics of what traditional success is measured by, but it's really only the earliest parts of the journey to have uh, a significant ongoing impact in the healthcare system. And uh, uh, the uh, fact is we need to expand our view and we believe we are expanding our view in, here in Canada uh, to be able to do that. So uh, this is a slide that I borrowed off Dr. Harindra Wajasandra, who, uh, as many of you know, uh, has just completed a leadership role at Cadeth, and uh, uh, really I think is a great uh, a simple sort of framework to look at to uh, understand the path to implementation. Many of these paths 
waypoints that have been discussed in presentations today. So uh, obviously regulatory approvals, think Health Canada, think FDA, then making sure health technology assessment uh, occurs in the given jurisdiction, They're usually the jurisdiction of the payer, and then uh, moving it down to reimbursement decisions, which happen at the level of the hospital and the regional health authorities or uh, Ministry of uh, Health uh, in our instance in Ontario. And then of course, at the hospital level, I, you know, we've got the $1.1 billion budget and procurement, it's public sector, it's public money. Uh, that's uh, at, at times uh, comf complicated and nuanced bit of business, but an important uh, uh, aspect that can present a barrier, a barrier that we need to make clearer and also lower the height of that barrier so that we can get better uh, and more nimble and be competitive on a global scale. So, um, Again, uh, from Harinder, I think this slide really captures really well a nice conceptualization of how something moves into the hospital and then moves across the system and across the world on a big, a big scale. So the blue line shows the uh, uh, adoption curve that we all know really well. And of course, when you're a, um, a scientist uh, and uh, early adopter in an innovative organization, you're playing around here, but where you want to get is up here, where you've got uh, something that's so terrific that it's influencing uh, health uh, outcomes on a large scale across the country and beyond. And uh, that takes time to get along this adoption curve, which is uh, uh, just a reality of human endeavor and innovation in all spheres of life. So more specifically, let's think about this in Canada and I'll make four points. So first of all, Canada is a federal system that is uh, highly decentralized and the regulatory approval to sort of enter the marketplace to this early adopter stage really coincides with uh, when you're seeing uh, uh, tests are done, some clinical trials have been done, Health Canada has assessed it, takes a long time. As Brian said, we've had uh, 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 people help us understand that it, with growing clarity, but it's conducted federally uh, and that uh, happens early on. And then once it's in that uh, marketplace and continues to sort of move along, uh, really the big picture sustainable funding, of course, the jurisdiction level is the province uh, with respect to uh, the payer. In many ways, it's, uh, it, it's a blessing that for our 14 million people in Ontario, we have a single third party payer. So if you can figure it out, uh, you've got to figure it out with a single uh, payer. And then, of course, the administration of healthcare is done uh, at the provincial level. So that's the overall model. So focused ultrasound, let's go back to that example. And this shows that moving from the great science or doing the, the phase one clinical trials on human subjects from 2011 all the way through the first patient being treated high impact papers starting to come through and uh, ultimately Health Canada approval. As you can see here, that took a period of five years. That's a long time, but that's lightning fast with respect to uh, uh, what we're used to in many instances. And I would say it's not unreasonable for us to be very impatient and say, the, the pace of making this happen, there's probably a sweet spot, not too fast, not the, but at the same time, the degree to which we can uh, push this uh, uh, and, and compress this will be, I believe, important for our patients and for our, our country's competitiveness. So you get it through to healthcare, Health Canada approval, and of course that's still really early on on that adoption uh, curve. So uh, this is where uh, you really ask, now what? How are we going to move it from this so that we're treating all of the 14 million people in uh, Ontario or, or beyond? And this is uh, really the area where I would say as a healthcare exec, uh, I certainly typically become much more at least aware of what's going on. Although I, I must say, I think it's increasingly important for, for all of you as scientists and innovators to try to get the uh, both the payer and the people uh, running, for example, hospitals and health systems uh, interested and engaged at the earliest possible stage. But there's no question, uh, I think it's important for me in my role to be uh, keenly paying attention at this stage. and and. And, and I'm uh, biased, but I do believe it's one of the uh, one of the advantages potentially of physician CEOs is that you have an attunedness and uh, appetite and aptitude for understanding the potential uh, impact of different uh, technological uh, advances. So 
2016, we got the approval for scalpel free surgery from uh, Health Canada. There again, Dr. Lipsman, uh, where the, the, uh, he's in the picture. There's a massive team behind him, as he'd be the first to point out. But he's thinking at this point, okay, how do we get uh, uh, OTAC ass ass uh, assessment? And then how do we get government funding on an ongoing basis? And we'll talk a bit about that. And I want to talk about the critical role of philanthropy, which I sometimes describe as a critical hack of the system. So what's this slide show? Well, this is the org chart of the Ministry of Health for Ontario. And really, uh, the main thing to take away from this is that it's complicated. There's a lot of people there, and I would posit that the vast majority of people in the uh, uh, audience today uh, do not have the time, interest, inclination, or, or, or experience on the ground to know all these folks and what they do. But uh, ultimately, there's a lot of folks, a lot of portfolios here, hardworking people that do critical work to administer our healthcare system, uh, that uh, it really becomes important to uh, understand their accountabilities, responsibilities, this strategy that they're uh, uh, beholden to follow. And understanding that really allows for uh, a, a good alignment. And this is a team sport to be able to do this. I think the executives at the hospital level become critical at this point. So you moved it along. Health Canada has said, let's go for it, uh, go or go forth and, uh, uh, and, and be successful. In Ontario, it's the Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee, or OTAC, uh, really uh, importantly takes this on. So in preparing for this talk, I went back to the uh, bureaucrat uh, who was terrific, who we worked with when we got the funding for uh, focused ultrasound for Tremor, and said, show me your deck or tell me what your thinking uh, is about this and i distilled her deck into one slide but ultimately the important thing she said to me is you know andy this is always evolving and we're a lot better now even than we were three years ago when we uh uh moved focused ultrasound for tremor through so the key bullets are all here otac is a subcommittee of ontario health itself a a, a new uh structure a, a new since this current government and uh, it's comprised of clinicians and patient reps. Again, note the patient focus. OTAC recommendations, uh, they assess clinical and cost effectiveness, budget, societal uh, impact and values and feasibility. So again, think of that value equals quality divided by uh, cost uh, equation. They have a standardized process and, and, and it's really, you can just see over recent years just how increasingly sophisticated and excellent that process has got, what an evidence-based uh, approach it is. And uh, really, once they say something looks like it's a positive at the OTAC level, it gets fed back into that org chart that I showed you earlier. So notably and critically, OTAC does not have a funding envelope. Funding comes from that complicated org chart. It comes from the Ministry of Health. So not gonna go into detail about uh, the overall big picture funding in Ontario, but here's the key pieces. Uh, health is the biggest portfolio, the biggest expenditure line of the government's uh, budget, $63.5 billion. About half or so of all the money, all the taxes that get collected get spent in the health sector. It's a big, big deal. And of the health sector, the three biggest things that pay for are uh, doctors, drugs and hospitals. And the biggest of those is uh, 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 you know, the hospital uh, sector and associated partners. So, so the government of Ontario, of course, they have to focus on delivering better care and better quality. But at the same time, they have to be laser focused on how to bend the cost curve in healthcare, which across the world is a uh, cause of growing angst as we have a growing aging population and increasing demands from uh, the consumer as to how we're going to take better care of them. So what I'll simply say is when we looked at something like focused ultrasound, we knew that this is a technology that can be applied to discrete patients to have discrete and important impact on a given patient. And we try to get it into the hopper of what's called activity-based funding. Simply put, what that means is let's figure out in a really detailed analysis and share and do this in collaboration with government, how much it's gonna cost for each specific episode. And remember cost is all kinds of things. Sure, it's the technology, but it's also people. And just for uh, scope and scale, we have a $1.1 billion budget, as I told you, 75% of that is people inside the hospital. Health is a very people heavy um, uh, cost center, I guess. 
And so really we try to get uh, government to say that they'll fund it. And then we try to say, can you do this many cases? Because we believe this is how many we can do and what society needs and here's the evidence to show it. So if you do more procedures than you target, you don't get any more uh, uh, payment. If you do fewer, you have to give the money back. Uh, and so if they say, do, we're paying you for 200, but you do 190, then you pay 10 times whatever the uh, amount per case is to go back. And uh, if it costs you more to do it than the price, you only get the, uh, the government's amount. So stop on that point and think about that. That's a uh, healthcare executives at the most simple level. One of the things they have to think about all the time is that it's a very good day when the revenue you get for something exceeds the expenditure because that has a sustainable business plan. If you don't have that, it's a, it becomes a problem. Uh, it becomes a discussion and you have to work it out and not an insoluble problem. Lots of examples of how together with uh, uh, clinicians we solve that. And um, if the acuity of your patient population uh, decreased or you get better and better at it, the truth is the reality is we've learned over and over that you start getting paid less. So this slide's entitled, It's a Partnership. And I wanna just uh, emphasize something that should be obvious to all of us and uh, I think is highly appropriate. This is a tweet from the Premier uh, back in about a year and a half ago and uh, talking about the focused ultrasound. You can see uh, in this picture, the health minister and Dr. Lipsman and myself. And government, of course, governments get elected and their goal is to do things that uh, help the people that elected them and pay the taxes. And so I, I think it's important to recognize that at key points on the journey to celebrate alongside them. So they, they recognize that their hard work and uh, their asset allocation to, uh, to uh, teams such as ours is making a difference in the lives of taxpayers and advancing Ontario's healthcare system so that it can be the best in the world. I put this slide up, which is my, uh, I just took a, a picture of the actual hard copy of this uh, article from Nature Reviews, which is uh, uh, Kulavo and Nir were uh, uh, co-authors together uh, with Dr. Ying Meng. And it's a terrific, uh, uh, terrific, uh, extensive overview of focused ultrasound and its wide range, its growing range of trials into an array of diseases of the brain and mind. So recognition that there's way more than just tremor that we can impact here, a wider range of uh, neurologic and psychiatric diseases. So the purpose of this slide, if you remember nothing else about it, it's, is that it's important to keep the uh, executives and up the, up the uh, payer chain up to speed as to what's happening in uh, the science. It's important for me also to, um, to be communicating it, to frankly be uh, waving the flag and to be telling society, government, et cetera, that this is really important, that in fact, uh, uh, there's great advances and to tell people, yeah, Nature Reviews, that's a very important uh, uh, journal. If they're talking about that, that uh, underscores just how important this work is. So uh, I wanna make the point that uh, if we're gonna continue and we will to branch into other aspects of uh, uh, care of diseases of the brain and mind, we don't have to go through all of those steps before uh, that were talked about before. We don't need to go through them all again. And this is uh, some bullet points I took from a conversation with me and Dr. Litzman, Lipsman just recently, uh, that of course a novel device doesn't need repeated Health Canada approval. So we have Health Canada approval for the focused ultrasound device that is essentially a lesion making device that uh, can be demonstrated to be used uh, with safety and with efficacy. So the conclusion therefore is that the first time through the process is the most difficult and uh, time consuming, but our subsequent indications, uh, we expect that the path should be shorter when we're bringing forward indications such as obsessive compulsive disorder uh, and major depressive disorder. So I mentioned at the outset, I wanted to talk briefly about philanthropy. Sunnybrook Foundation uh, and Sunnybrook are what uh, John Delandrea, the CEO of the foundation and I like to call Team Sunnybrook, joined at the hip, highly aligned in the strategy, highly aligned in the areas of focus. And uh, uh, we recognize that philanthropy uh, plays a key role, an indispensable role as a, a hack of the, I call it, of the adoption journey. So what do I mean? A foundation brings in about say 50 to 80 million dollars a year that's much smaller than the overall budget of a hospital, but it's key, that's substantial, a key money to be able to invest in both capital and also initiatives 
that uh, we've uh, focused on together with our scientists and clinicians to uh, be able, uh, and company partners, for example, to push forward. So this uh, slide shows a depiction of um, one of the posters related to the focused ultrasound work. So let me di digress for one slide on something that's different than the focused ultrasound and diseases of the brain to show exactly what that looks like. Our group, under the leadership of Dr. Strauss, Wedgesandra, and others, was one of the very earliest um, in the country involved in minimally invasive structural heart uh, innovations, or MedTech. This is the idea that instead of doing an open heart surgery where you open someone's breastbone, a long operation, long, long ICU and ward stay to fix their valve, that we can completely change the game and uh, via uh, an artery thread a valve up through the uh, arterial system into the heart and replace the valve and uh, save the person from a big operation so it's good for patient experience, get the same type of quality output and ultimately be cheaper. Why is it cheaper? This thing's expensive. That, that little valve is very expensive, but it's not as expensive as 14 days in the hospital, not even close, and especially as the population gets older and bigger. So in this real example, we came through the trials, came through the Health Canada approval. We're starting to do some cases, but it was going to be a long journey to get to the point of uh, being able to uh, have the funder pay. And millions of dollars were invested by uh, the foundation to be able to do the first hundreds of cases that allowed us to both build evidence together with our government partner to show this is going to be better. It is better, and we need to expand this for Ontarians. So pivoting now to what about commercialization, or I could have wrote, uh, uh, wrote uh, the title here, what about companies? Companies are important, and they're important for Canadians, they're important for us, and they uh, uh, should be uh, a bright spotlight shine on this uh, in our academic health science centers together with our partners in the private sector. And uh, I, of course, I, I, you, all, you all know because I told you I'm a doctor first, and the quality of care and the patient experience is really, really important. But let's face the basic facts that the world is evolving, our country is evolving, and we should be warmly embracing this reality. Health tech represents a $250 billion global market. So why can't we as Canadians with the incredible brain power, resources, teams, partnerships that we have be amongst the absolute very best in the world? Why would we, uh, why can't we do that? Well, the answer is we can. We just need to continue to move from what I characterize as our adolescence in this space into our confident adulthood uh, uh, in, in that market. So uh, lots that could be spoken about uh, with respect to companies and commercialization. I do want to make mention of uh, accelerators. Uh, Toronto Innovation Acceleration Partners, formerly Mars Innovation, is certainly one that uh, uh, um, we are closely involved with at Sunnybrook together with partners. And of course, one of the uh, items that accelerators do is help with the creation of companies, the nurturing of companies, getting the capital that takes them across the, uh, uh, the valleys of death, the, the challenges that uh, uh, funding and other barriers present. But uh, I guess if you remember one thing from this slide, I'd like you to re remember that for us to continue to evolve in Toronto, Ontario, and Canada, I think that there are certain things we need to recognize that we do better as, for example, Team Toronto than we do as individuals. Not always, but sometimes. And that's something that we needs to be a prominent part of one's mindset. A second thing I want to talk about is the Can Health Network. It's one example, I could have chosen others, but it's one that Sunnybrook's involved with, with partners, and it shows again the involvement and the partnership with government. The fact that government says we want to be uh, funding, we want to be funding you richly and get you working together, academe connected with healthcare systems, connected with uh, companies in the private sector, because we need to incent and accelerate platforms that uh, uh, bring med tech and medical innovation more rapidly into the healthcare environment and allow growth of small and medium uh, uh, sized businesses in Canada to larger and indeed even global businesses. So I won't go into this in detail, except to say that uh, uh, Sunnybrook is one of the partners in uh, 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 across the country with this. And the idea is that you can have um, a concierge connection of companies together with healthcare organizations such as Sunnybrook and say, you guys would be really great with this uh, innovation. Um, can you try this out? We'll help uh, pay for it and help accelerate that to get this 
show that it can work in your hospital. And then by the way, if it does work, we can have you uh, procuring that more formally and we'll take away the procurement barriers across the rest of the country so that you can uh, move ahead. Uh, it's, it's early days, but there is a growing array of uh, uh, successes in that regard. So this is my second last slide. It's another example, and it's one that Dr. Hinnan then mentioned in his opening remarks, the Strategic Innovation Fund Grant, or the SIF grant, worth about $150, uh, $125 uh, million dollars in total. Government money, $49 million of government money, and company money connecting together uh, uh, academe, uh, the healthcare sector, and uh, uh, companies, recognizing that, for example, from a Sunnybrook perspective, Obviously, image-guided therapeutics are amongst the most important things that we've got a whole generation worth of focus and development and success in. AI is a big deal uh, in general in med tech, and it's a big area of strength in Toronto. We should be harnessing our world-class strength in both image-guided therapeutics and in uh, AI and being able to connect up in an increasingly nimble, effective way between research institutes, universities, companies and uh, form partnerships that ultimately take science, move it along in a more nimble way to get into the clinic faster and to enrich our knowledge economy. So final slide, uh, a quote that you've all seen many times, but it's one of my favorites. I think this time is different. It's different from 10 years ago. And we need to expect this to be a different time. And we need to expect to be doing better in Canada. Uh, and uh, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And I would put it to you that the idea that we can be better than anyone, uh, uh, absolutely world class with respect to taking top notch science produced by top notch people and moving it through our system and compete on the global stage should be our expectation. So thanks very much for having invited me and uh, apologize for the power outage. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thanks, Andy. That was really spectacular. And um, uh, I'm glad that we were able to recover from that because so much of what you said there was so, uh, so important for the uh, participants to hear from, uh, from you directly. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to transition quickly over to Dr. Samantha Hill. Uh, Dr. Samantha Hill, uh, I've known probably for 10 or 12 years now. She's a cardiac surgeon, and I always look forward to looking after cases with her. Uh, she uh, does uh, cardiac surgeries both at St. Michael's Hospital as well as here at Sunnybrook. And um, Uh, she's uh, also recently been uh, uh, elected for positions with the government, and uh, I just thought it'd be a great opportunity to bring her in uh, to, to talk with the group and also to have her involved in the discussion around various aspects of, of, of innovation um, and uh, looking forward to her talk. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, I'll let her uh, get started here. Thank you, Samantha, for joining us. Thanks so much for that. And I apologize in advance. I have a, another commitment at noon and so I'll delay a little bit, but I will have to probably cut some of our questions short at the end. Um, as Brian has said, I am the president of the Ontario Medical Association and one of my principal interests for this year, you know, above and beyond negotiations and surviving a world defining plague pandemic was uh, to try and address some of the diversity and equity issues that we see in medicine. And the OMA has tackled that head on. We've looked at and released a really important report called the uh, Gender Pay Gap Report. But the question for this group that I would have you think is how does that fit into the conversation of innovation? And so I'll be talking today about the concept of gender inequity in innovation and why that's happening and what we can do about it. And so without further ado, I'm gonna switch over to my screen and I'm also gonna stop my video because I'm suffering from residential uh, internet speeds, which means that if I try and stream video and PowerPoint at the same time, you guys get nothing. So I will turn the video back on at the end of the conversation. And do, 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 someone will let me know if this is working appropriately. Let's share that screen. And let us do there you this. go we can see your screen now and now i just need to make it a slideshow and then then we're in business from beginning That's great all right 
So here we go. Um, and so, like I said, we'll be talking about gender inequity and how, despite the fact that we all talk about gender equality, it's actually still everywhere. And it's really time for us as physicians and uh, for you as innovators to tr look at our own house and figure out what our responsibility is there. So a few definitions because I learned early on that you have to make sure everyone's talking about the same thing. And that is that gender parity is the idea or the instrument at the service of equality. And it means ensuring the access of men and women to the same opportunities, rights, um, the opportunities to choose and material conditions while respecting their specificities. And so what that means ultimately is that each gender is represented equally to the form that they desire to be so. Gender pay gap is a very different term, and it refers to the difference between what the men and women earn for roughly equivalent work. And it is very different and extends far beyond um, the concept of just equal pay for equal work and looks at the link to legal socioeconomic factors that affect you. So the question is, why does it matter? And it's far beyond the idea of just being fair or doing the right thing. Gender parity has a fundamental bearing on whether or not economies and societies thrive. Developing and deploying one half of the world's available talent has a huge bearing on the growth, competitiveness, and the future readiness of economies and business worldwide. In September of 2015, so a few years ago now, the McKinsey Global Institute actually argued that advancing women's equality could add 28 trillion of the additional annual GDP in 2025. And so that's the equivalent to the combined US and Chinese economies, and that's what we're sitting on when we don't address this. The gender pay gap itself as a marker of inequality can be a problem from public policy perspective, even if it is entirely voluntary, which we'll argue it isn't, because of the reduced economic output from that half of the population. In medicine itself, we talk about a diverse workforce, and we know that a diverse workforce can provide better care for diverse patients. As medicine has continued to become more gender balanced, there does need to be a focus on pay equity. Not just, as I said, because equal pay for equal work is a matter of fairness, but also because it's a necessity for the medical profession to improve and advance. Females obviously play a key role in the healthcare system and need to be recognized and compensated accordingly. But more importantly than that, I would argue, is that there's plenty of evidence that increased participation by women improves the innovation, the performance, and the organization of society. Research shows that diverse inclusive teams are more innovative and that diverse companies are more profitable. In 2009, Turner demonstrated that gender diversity increases the innovation performance of individuals in R&D teams, whereas an article in Spain showed that R&D teams' gender diversity is positively related to radical innovation. So in part, obviously, this is simply a question of increasing numbers by widening the pool of talent. One increases the chances of valuable new insights emerging. But there's also the idea that women can bring a different perspective and do so. Women innovators help to ensure that new products and processes meet the needs of the whole population and not just half of it. So briefly outside of medicine, the idea is that there is a gender pay gap. And again, we're using this as a marker for inequity um, across the world. And so globally, gender parity stands at 68%. The Canadian government has been taking steps to address this issue broadly, but we still sit in a place where only 26% of board directors in Canada are women, or 20% of you were on the call I was on last night, and where we're looking at over 150 years until gender parity in North America. Now, this is North America we're talking about, a space where we all feel reasonably equal and well represented. So it's a mind shocking number. But then I hear my colleagues say, but medicine is different, particularly here in Ontario, but medicine is different. You know, we're, we're, we're fairer or more even. And recent evidence suggests that that's, oh, sorry. Technically, there we go. Recent evidence suggests that's probably not so true. Um, internationally, female doctors in countries make 20 to 30% less than their colleagues. That gap is great, greatest in places like Brazil, but it's seen everywhere, even through to Germany, where women and male, men make at least 20% difference, respectively. In Canada, women account for 11% of the physicians um, in 1978, 
and went up to 43% in 2018. But only 8% of the province's highest billings, if we all remember that article that came out of the Toronto Star a little while ago. They're underrepresented in specialties with the highest net income. They're overrepresented in the three specialties with the lowest net income. Outside of medicine, Canada continues to defend its top spot in the region as far as equity index and has shown moderate improvement across a range of parity indicators. But the country's gender gap on educational attainment is still over 70, 70%, 77%, excuse me. So there's still a lot of ways to go. In 2018 in medicine, CMA published a damning review of equity in the profession. Family doctors were earning 84 cents on the dollar of their male counterparts. Female specialists were earning 63 cents on the dollar. And women were five times more likely than their male colleagues to experience opposition to career advancement, three times more likely to experience disrespectful or punitive actions. They're significantly underrepresented in leadership positions, hospital leadership, medical association leadership, and more. And this is important because the answers for the, the reasons for this are fulsome. And it's not a simple question of working less hard. There's a lot of contributing factors. Um, the technological age and the changing physician patient relationship and the expectations associated with that haven't been reflected in the pay schedule. And so as we move forward, we'll talk more about that. In the context of time though, I'll jump a little bit over to the fact that the inequities start early in the stages of a medical career and they deepen time with estimates that it can cost as much as two and a half million dollars over a 30 year career. I'll reiterate again that it is not because of the choices that women are making voluntarily. And we can discuss how the system biases even those choices that seem to be voluntary. This next slide is really busy um, and I apologize for that, but what it demonstrates to you is three different papers that have come out in the last decade, all Ontario based, all of which demonstrate a significant pay gap. The first gra graph over here on the left is from Boris Kraj, and it demonstrates that in every single specialty, gross fee for service payments for men are higher than women. That yellow line is your parity indicator. The middle graph is the Peter plot by Drs. Cohen and Curran, which came out earlier this year. And that demonstrates the fact that if you scatter plot physicians by specialty, the top being gross payments, the bottom being average net income, there's significant discrepancies between how that um, maps out. And then the third graph is an older graph. Um, it's funny that in this day and age, an older graph is two years old, but it's an older graph, and it's by Dussa et al. And it's about the sex-based disparities in surgery. And the findings of this study were particularly interesting because they dispelled the myth that women don't earn as much simply because they don't work as hard. It showed that a significant pay gap persists even when we all work equal hours, and that male surgeons earned more per hour than female surgeons in almost every area. In part, that was because female surgeons had fewer opportunities to perform certain type of procedures. And so the question was, well, how bad can it really be? And the answer is about 24%. Female surgeons earn 24% less per hour than male surgeons. And this did not disappear after adjusting for specialty. So then the next question was, well, maybe men just operate faster. And it's true, female surgeons had practiced for fewer years than their male surgeons in this rate. And we know that we get faster as we go on. But the interesting thing was there was no differences in time taken by male and female surgeons to perform these procedures. That said, female surgeons were still commonly performing procedures that had lowest hourly earnings. So this is the OMA paper that came out. Uh, there's a lot more to it and you can look it up, but the gross point of it is that the unadjusted gap after adjusting for all of the variables that reflect standard labor market inputs that expected to be related to pay, such as tenure, days of work, specialty, pay models, part-time status after hours work, etc. You can see them here on the list. Once you do that, the daily unadjusted difference is 30%. And a lot of that is based on specialty selection and is based on relativity issues within the profession. But once you account for it, it's 15%. And that gap consists as consistent across assemblies, across location, across setting of practice. It changes a little bit, and that variability might give insight into the whys and the hows, but 
overall, we know that women in Canadian medicine are consistently earning less than men. And that exists no matter how you look at it after accounting for expected confounders and is not explained by women working less or less efficiently. I'll raise the caveat, of course, that gender is not that binary and there's very little data on the intersection of identities. And so that does need to be addressed at some point. So why have I spent five or 10 minutes talking about pay gaps when we're talking about equity? And the reason for that is that it's important to our discussion because obviously financial freedom frees time and energy for leadership and for innovation. So when we look at the causes of the inequity, the OMA report, um, and if you're still with me, by the way, we're already making progress here. The OMA report relates a lot to systemic bias um, and highlights challenges. And I could have shown you the slide, but I, honestly, they're very overwhelming. And if we look at closing the gap, gap it includes things like oppression training and challenging the hidden curriculum. And we drilled down on the four areas where we think we have the capacity and the feasibility to demonstrate and cause effect. That being said, if you look at the Cohen and Kieran paper, it's a much wider paper. And it talks about the institutional legacy of sexism within medical school, clinical care arrangements, health organizations, and the fee system itself. And you'll see here on the right side of the screen, some of the systemic biases that are still being faced by women in medicine. And although they're decreasing and we see less women directed away from some medical careers, we're still seeing that happen. In the early stages of their careers, uh, the hidden curriculum both subtly and overly encourages female trainees and their specific and lower paid specialties. And they're more likely as a result to experience imposter syndrome and to have lower salary expectations. They're more likely to have that anchored later when they find out that they actually have lower starting salaries. And so this is part of the challenge when you're talking about innovation, you're talking about advancement, is how do you get women into these spaces? Once women have graduated, they face subtle and unconscious biases in recruitment and hiring and advancement. And we know that there are fewer women in medical leadership roles and of high rank, which perpetuates the biases and limits entering, limits role models. Men in leadership benefit from all, not only the higher income associated with leadership, but also can perpetuate the policies and the informal support networks that wind up recruiting, retaining, and promoting other men at disproportionately higher rates. And we've done, gone a long way in trying to minimize that, but it still boils down to that idea of considering when you have someone to hire and you hire the people you know that you've met over golf or that you've met over some other forum, your networks tend to be more like you than they tend to be diverse. This is a truism of humanity. In 1980s, the International Labor Organization and Catalyst um, discussed and identified the glass ceiling theory about artificial barriers based on attitudinal organizational bias that prevents qualified individuals from advancing upward in management level positions. We'll talk a little bit later about missing rungs, which may actually be more important than the glass ceiling. Finally, Obviously, changes in clinical care arrangements lead to inequity and lead to disparities and social attitudes towards women and their role and the expectations of. These factors influence the proportion of women in leadership, which affects not just income, but also hiring, promotion, and important opportunities for innovation. So let us... talk about disparity and innovation. I wonder if anyone knows who this is. When I asked our Chief of Economics, Policy and Research to identify today's female leaders in medtech and innovation, he couldn't think of a single one. That's not a very good sign, which isn't to say there hasn't been any. Yet. This person in the picture is Dr. Diana Schatz. She died recently at age 80, and she was one of the very few women who studied biochemistry at U of T in the 1950s. She experienced a lot of pushback in her classes, which were dominated by men and after, when her PhD was called inferior and should lead everyone to question the entire concept of meritocracy. But she's the woman and she's the person who began the Toronto Institute of Medical Technology, now known as the Missioner Institute, inventing the first education program for lab technologists with groundbreaking programs in everything from chirurgy to imaging to respiratory therapy, genetics. It was a much needed teaching model proven by how rapidly it caught on across Ontario Hospital. And medical officer Brian Hodge said she was an innovative 
an innovator who didn't stop at her own profession. As you'll see, this is a typical female in innovation, collaborative on the fringes of STEM, i.e. thinking education and training, and inspired by local needs to meet societal demands. An analysis from WIPS shows that there's more, that far more men and women gain pa patents for their inventions, with less than a third of all international patent applications, including women inventors. Granted, that's up from 17% in 1995, but it's still very low. And it's a problem because anything that restricts innovation and creativity means that we're all less off, well off. We're missing out on the potential benefits of those lost great ideas. So why is this happening? Well, there's widespread gender inequality in social and economic life. And in most countries, for example, far fewer girls than boys study scientific, technical, engineering, medical subjects. Even in Canada, the rate of women in engineering is far below that elsewhere. In consequence, a relatively low proportion of women work in the fields that produce the most technical innovation. Prejudice, preconceptions, and stereotypes, all too many women, all too many people think of women as being limited to certain traditional roles. And that results, of course, in rather than having them be potential leaders, they lack the role models to see and to, to emulate. Inflexible economic and social structures can restrict career prospects. Missing rungs I referred to earlier refers to talented women who succeed as students and in the early stages of their career, only to be denied opportunities required for late promotions. Think of absent mentoring and then trying to apply for a large grant without a well padded CV of previous successes. This is especially true if you take time out to have children. And finally, financial risk tolerance. There's an argument that women prioritize the stability of their family income, making them more risk averse than men. If we look at Canada's tech sector, and I'm not gonna read you this slide, the only part I'll read you is that one line that says we absolutely have a problem. And so what this makes you here is the fact that Despite the tech sector and the current boom being considered the apex of innovation, several damning studies have pointed to troubling anti-female biases, despite knowing that female-led companies have posted better returns than those with no female senior leaders. The left side slide describes the current abysmal state of female leadership in tech innovation. There's data showing that women make better entrepreneurs, investors, and that gender and racial inclusion makes for stronger teams. And there's certainly no shortage of data on uh, which we see on the right to demonstrate that inclusion has actually gotten worse. And this includes decline in the share of women-led tech firms that receive venture financing since the dot-com boom. Theoretical reasons why increasing the share of women directors might be associated with better performance include that the markets themselves are gender diversified and more diverse boards might lead to better understanding of the marketplace. Uh, as well as the fact that there are more skills and qualifications that are available in diverse boards. The point here, though, is that women need to see role models, and they've been proactive in asking for it. I heard recently a nice statement, which is that one token person, whether it's a female or a BIPOC or a disabled individual, isn't going to change much. Just as one female board member doesn't change much, you need to have at least two. Until you start seeing multiples in roles, there's not a change. And the quote was, one is lonely, two is competition, three is a collaborative force. So how do we address the gender gap or the gender inequity in health innovation? And it's a really good question because while there's gender on data, uh, while there is gender data on mortality and morbidity, there's very limited gender disaggregated global data on specific diseases. Health data disaggregated by gender is critical for generating evidence in the development and utilization of health innovations, something this group well knows, such as drugs and medical equipment, as well as for articulation in health interventions like programs, policies that advance equality. Addressing the gender gap in innovation requires a reboot in the way we think about innovation. From tracking disease, specifically, disease data specifically for women, tailoring medical treatments and technologies to meet the specific needs of women. And this includes and this includes ensuring inclusion in all stages of innovation research. This slide talks to the fact that the institutional environment matters for innovative activity by women. 
Innovative thinking is required for integrating the gender perspective in innovative milieus in order to enrich, diversify, and promote stronger innovation activities. Mobilizing unexploited opportunities for managers in the business sector and policymakers in the public one are essential. Policies need to be designed to reduce the gap in innovation by fighting against gender segregation in the job market and against gender differences in education and training. They have to increase flexibility in the workplace by providing more help to conciliate family and working lives and reducing the gap in family responsibilities taken on by women. I think this might be my last slide. I'm sure you're all excited to wait for that. Um, so at this point, we're looking at the extensive literature of innovation that provides very few papers on the link between gender and innovation, despite the fact there's a lot of data on gender and entrepreneurship. Furthermore, in the theory, innovation literature is supposed to be gender neutral, as individuals are invisible. In practice, it's actually something called gender blind. And so what I mean by that is that there are many definitions of innovation exist and in many different different environments. And when there's little consideration of the individuals, the gender perspective is marginalized and remains under considered. The result of this is that mostly only male implemented innovations are considered and the way they are operationalized and measured is strongly male gendered. What does that mean? In practice, it means the types, the measures, and the sectors analyzed have strong male connotations. Most studies are conducted on male innovations such as technological process and product innovations in industries that have been for a long time exclusively male controlled. Areas like service sector, wholesale and retail trade, transport, government, financial, professional and personal services, education, healthcare, real estate services, which frankly represent the majority of most nations GDP and where women are more prevalent are underrepresented. It's also been argued that women are quote unquote dominated by men. And what they mean by that is that innovation displays a domination effect, leading to a biased masculine viewpoint. Innovators are supposed to have leading and dominating positions when they implement new products and processes in a very competitive market. And these are described as radical incremental innovations. These innovations are implemented in industries and sectors led by men, which brings in balance favoring male innovations. I remind everyone about the conversation we had a minute or two ago about the rise of glass ceilings and the missing rungs and how that affects innovation. Female type in implemented innovations and female controlled industries are reasonably neglected and marginalized in innovation studies. Programs and policy research neglects types of innovations made by women. New kinds of areas and new determinants of innovation are not yet or only partially explored and limited definitions are binary, and often one dimensional measures. Things like radical product, competitive and technological innovations are most often implemented by men. There's literature that suggests and that shows that men and women have different approaches when they innovate. Women conduct innovations that are largely inspired by local needs to achieve social and environmental goals. This literature doesn't take into account new and other types of innovation studied in emerging literature like incremental, social, organizational, creative, and imitative innovations are implemented by women very often at grassroots levels of organizations. And it explains to a large extent why male norms are widely adopted as standard. So that was a lot of information, but what can we learn from that when it comes to considering a gendered angle to innovation? We've already discussed what leads to women's marginalization and the lack of women in top decision-making positions. These inequality reduction mechanisms and decision-making positions are the same even in the area of innovation. Namely, existing practices or male-implemented practices favor male models of being and modes of control. We need to get to a place where we recognize that innovation, much like leadership, cannot be locked into preset definitions. It must capture more innovations. We must look at product, process, design, and social innovation. It was my last slide. That's exciting. All right. And so with that, I'll leave you with the idea that innovation appears to be a key factor for the success of companies to increase their competitiveness and their growth, especially in early stages or in transitional stages when they need to mature or generate more cash flow. And that doing so, creates new employment opportunities. And so I'll leave you with questions to consider about your observations and experiences around the inequities and the gap in innovation. And how would you encourage more people to pursue MedTech? How do you mentor more people into this environment of innovation? 
How has COVID-19 changed the challenges and opportunities? We've seen great changes in healthcare with respect to virtual care. But how has it changed things with COVID-19? And there was a question in the chat group a few minutes ago about the changing bylaws and whether or not that makes things better or worse. And finally, for those of us in the medical profession, what can we do to support the involvement and the integration of medical technology? Thank you, Samantha. Uh, thank you for putting that together. And it's an important topic. Uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, from all angles is an incredibly important topic these days. And um, it's very relevant in the innovation uh, eco space uh, as well, social innovation. Um, and it's really, it's really bringing things to where, where they ought to be. Um, you know, I run an organization with 100 people that work for it of various levels of education. Um, and uh, one of the things that I, I really enjoy about uh, running Canavi Medical um, is uh, we do have an incredibly uh, diverse group. 40% uh, of our employees are women. Um, we have incredibly strong performers uh, across all genders and backgrounds. And, uh, and so that's one of the things I really enjoy. Um, you know, when I started off as an engineer, as my initial uh, career path, um, I was uh, uh, in the overwhelming uh, majority of uh, participants in engineering, 84 people in my class, of whom only four were women. Um, when I moved to medicine, it was a 50-50 split. So that was, uh, I think, you know, really um, a nice change uh, uh, for me to be exposed to the other half of the world in my professional career, <laughs> incredibly important. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, 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 salutations to you for um, taking a, a stand, uh, an important stand on, on something here to uh, advance medicine. I think medical technology, um, because we are creating a new sector uh, in Ontario, it doesn't quite have perhaps some of the entrenched positions that more established industries might have, and it creates an opportunity to, um, to move things forward. And certainly the government's been supportive of this with their Women in Technology program, where they fund uh, women entrepreneurs um, and provide them supports to get started. Um, and um, that, uh, and we have some successes. Um, Eve Medical uh, in Toronto is a, a, a woman founded medical technology company. Swift Medical has a C-level uh, person uh, on their executive board. And there are, are I think, um, as this industry grows and matures, I think you're gonna see more and more examples of opportunity created for that. Um, one thing I know that you have to leave, and, I, and, and I'm really looking forward to getting to, to Suzanne Barron, who uh, is an incredibly uh, accomplished interventional cardiologist from the States um, on board. Uh, uh, um, it's funny, Andy Smith was talking about TAVIs, and then you sent me a little text saying that aortic valve replacement is your favorite procedure in the world. And then we're going to go to Suzanne Barron, who has uh, presented some of the most important papers around the cost effectiveness of TAVI. Um, so uh, we'll be uh, getting uh, uh, a good, good cross-section of, of opinions around aortic valve replacement uh, in this session uh, indirectly. But um, uh, you know, one question I want to ask of you from OMA perspective, and this is a bit separate from the, from the gender discussion that you highlighted so well. Um, when we want to do innovation, when we want to get new technologies out there into the market, um, reimbursement is a big part of that. And then we have this dual sort of arrangement where the pro there's only one way to get a device into a patient in Ontario, and that's through the publicly funded healthcare system. You know, drugs can be paid for out of pocket, um, or a private insurance can pay for it, or public health insurance can pay for it. But to bring a new innovation in the device space, it requires physicians and the publicly funded healthcare system. And, um, you know, there's a lot of inertia behind how reimbursement happens. Um, physicians have a stake at the table. And maybe one thing just to, to talk about, uh, to get your opinion on is, is where might the Ontario Medical Association have an opportunity to um, uh, 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 play a role in terms of physicians uh, as a collective um, saying, hey, we're ready to forego some things we used to get reimbursed for that maybe aren't that much value add, but as newer technologies come in, if we wanna do those and get paid to adopt those, how, do, how does that conversation happen within the 32,000 physicians, there are multiple um, subgroups that you represent. I'm laughing because they say never stand between people and lunch and here we are at 12.15 opening up a kettle of fish <laughs> that could be a full day conversation. The short answer to that is that funding decisions go through a process called the MSPC, the Medical Services Payment Com and Physician Committee. And so as budgets get 
developed and as budgets are negotiated for the PSB, that money then comes down into different pockets that needs to be assigned. And what we've been doing at the OMA of late is trying to work on not just intersectional relativity, but intrasectional relativity. And what that means is we know that even in fields such as cardiology, um, that there's a discrepancy between the interventional cardiologists and the less interventional cardiologists, or the more diagnostic interventional, uh, diagnostic cardiologists, sorry. Um, and so essentially fee-for-service as a payment plan promotes more action and pays better for procedural activities. This is just a well-known thing. And in fact, it was initially rolled out to try and encourage that activity. But when we're looking at how to bring in new approved technologies and you're trying to figure out where the money for that is, it might be well within that process of intrasectional relativity where you can say to um, the cardiology group that, I don't want to pick an example, I'm not going to label anyone, but you can pick an example within your group and say, this thing that used to take us two hours to do and now takes us 20 minutes to do, maybe we should cut funding in half for that and use that available funding for this new thing that we're trying to bring in. I know what we do in cardiac surgery a lot is we make shift codes because there hasn't been a revision of codes in almost 10, 20 years at this point. And so things like, uh, an easy example is a tissue bental. There's no code for that, even though it's different than a bental surgery. Um, and, but we bill it as a bental and ridiculously every once in a while it gets refused. And then you have to try and explain to someone who doesn't understand physiology or surgery why they're actually the same conceptual surgery. So similarly, as we move forward with bringing in new technology, you'll have to find spaces within that budget where it, it takes over a, a fiduciary duty that another part of the budget used to hold and use that money in exchange. The other approach, of course, is to find ways of getting paid for things that are outside of OHIP but are still insured. And so virtual care prior to COVID was one of those examples where we had rolled out um, much like WSIB payments or things like that. You could approach different areas of the government for funding for a variety of procedures that are not OHIP billed and therefore outside of the PSA, PSB um, discussion. Well, thanks. I know that you have uh, uh, another uh, meeting you have to be at, but I really appreciate you doing that. And if there are questions that come from the discussion group, I might forward them to you after the fact. So thanks so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm always available. Samantha.hill at OMA.org. Have a great day and good luck. Thank you. Take care. Um, it's a, a real pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Suzanne Barron. Uh, Dr. Barron, I met her first uh, just, uh, just over a year ago. Um, at uh, one of the large interventional cardiology conferences called TCT. Um, she is a, a cardiologist that uh, uh, was uh, born and raised in the Boston area, um, went to uh, college in the Boston area at Harvard and then uh, to Yale for medical school and uh, back at Massachusetts General Hospital for ongoing cardiology training. Um, did a master's in clinical epidemiology, um, has spent a year working at the FDA in device uh, evaluation, and um, is uh, very um, much involved in the structural heart space, which is one of the more rapidly evolving parts of interventional cardiology over the course of the past 10 years. Um, she's uh, got her real uh, area of specialization from a research perspective in, in something that's incredibly important to payers of healthcare and um, prioritization of healthcare resources. And that is in uh, the assessment of cost effectiveness of, of new technologies, quality of life assessments, um, and determining you know, where is it that we should be spending our resources in order to get uh, the, most, the most benefit to people um, whilst not bankrupting the system. Uh, so um, when I heard her uh, speak and she presented on two of the most important technological advances in cardiology at TCT, uh, one on uh, mitral uh, valve interventions uh, with a technology called MitraClip, um, and then again with uh, aortic valve interventions um, uh, 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 through the Partner 3 trial, I believe it was. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I heard her speak and I just thought um, her background in terms of how new technologies um, get uh, developed uh, and then um, 
presented to be something that should be uh, 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 more broadly adopted um, and to show that there is cost, cost effectiveness um, uh, would be incredibly uh, relevant to the audience. So I'm really uh, glad that uh, Dr. Barron was able to join us today and uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Thanks so much, I appreciate that. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Excellent. Okay. Um, so today I will be discussing how to balance the costs and benefits of medical innovation. Are we penny wise, but pound and foolish? Uh, these are my disclosures. So throughout history, innovation and medicine have gone hand in hand. The development of the smallpox vaccine by Edward Jenner, Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin, Dr. Edward Morton's first use of ether to perform oral surgery, all of these events represent a pivotal turning point in the practice of medicine and have changed the face of healthcare forever. Now, in most industries, technological innovation results in a benefit to the consumer in the form of decreased cost. Technological advances that improve production efficiency will shift the supply curve to the right, and it will cause the cost of production to decrease and consumers will demand more product at lower prices. However, in medicine, the opposite is sometimes true, in that many advancements in technology seem to result in higher prices and greater healthcare expenditures. Well, why is that? Well, when we have a new treatment modality or device becomes available, patients and their providers, they want access to the, to the best and the brightest and the newest technology that's there. And this causes the demand curve to shift to the right and prices increase. Now, the degree to which the demand curve shifts is affected in part by the size of the potential consumer population. The larger the target patient group, the bigger the demand. Furthermore, often these drugs and these devices, they cost billions of dollars to develop. And so it's easier to recoup the cost for products that have a broad application. And so our healthcare spending continues to rise. And it currently accounts for almost 18% of the US GDP, with medical technology costing an estimated 6% of healthcare expenditures. But at some point, the money will run out. And so basic economic theory kicks in. Our wants for technology development and patient care are unlimited, but our healthcare resources are limited. And so we end up having to be in the situation to make decisions regarding resource allocation. Now, with any decision to fund a new healthcare innovation, it's inevitable there will be winners and losers in the patient population because we can't fund everything. The winners will be the patients who are benefiting from the new technology. Now, in a single payer system, uh, the, uh, the losers are those patients who may have their health services displaced in order to pay for the new technology. Whereas in an insurance-based system, the losers might be those patients who are priced out of coverage as premiums rise to pay for the new treatment. And while resources may have been limited before, we know that they'll be even more so in the post-COVID era. Healthcare systems are strapped financially. They'll be likely less able to support new technologies or even trials to assess the efficacy of a new drug or device. And so being able to quantify the value that a new technology offers to the patient, the healthcare system, and society as a whole is of the utmost importance. So cost effectiveness analyses give us a formal way to assign value to a particular drug or technology by allowing us to weigh the cost of the intervention with its effectiveness. Now, in order to use cost effectiveness analyses as a tool to quantify value, it's necessary to understand a few fundamental principles about these types of analyses. First, the results of a cost effectiveness analysis are often reported as an incremental cost effectiveness ratio or an ICER. The incremental cost effectiveness ratio compares the differences of the costs between two treatments with the difference in benefits between these two treatments. To calculate an ICER, we first need to calculate the cost of each of these treatments. So in the case of transcatheter versus surgical AVR, uh, this will include the cost of the index procedure. So things like the valve implant, sheaths, surgical equipment, um, and the overhead cost of the procedure room. All costs in the index hospitalization besides the index procedure need to be considered as well. So in the case of a PCI, for example, it could be minimal with just an overnight stay in a cardiac step-down unit, 
But in the case of open heart surgery, it could be much more substantial given longer length of stay and need for ICU care. Follow-up medical costs, those include a whole gamut of things such as the cost of repeat hospitalizations, rehab or long-term care costs, outpatient diagnostic testing, outpatient clinic or ER visits, medication costs, and then finally physician fees need to be considered for both the index and the follow-up costs. So once we have assigned costs to a particular intervention, we next need to decide how do you quantify the benefits that that intervention provides. So in analyses of medical treatments, it's often measured in extra years of survival or life years gained. But an intervention's benefit shouldn't be measured only in terms of survival. Health-related quality of life also needs to be considered and incorporated into this metric, particularly since many patients, especially elderly, have been shown to value quality as much or even more than quantity of life. The most common way of combining both quality of life and survival into a single metric is with the use of qualies or quality adjusted life years. A quality is a measure of disease burden in which the quantity of life is weighted by the valuation of the quality of life that a person experiences. So the unit of ICERs is usually described as cost per quality gained. So when we're performing a cost effectiveness analysis, it's important to understand the time frame that it's being performed from. A cost analysis should start with the time the treatment's administered and then extend through the period in which all or at least most of those benefits from that treatment are expected to accrue. This could be a year, could be five years, could be a lifetime. A longer time frame is especially necessary in the cases of treatments that either require an upfront investment like a costly procedure or for treatments in whom the majority of benefits are not accrued until later, such as with bioresorbable cardiac stents. Um, accordingly, the choice of time horizon may affect both costs and benefits, and thus affects both the numerator and the denominator of the ICER. Additionally, cost effectiveness analyses can be performed from many different perspectives. For example, the payer's perspective or the hospital system's perspective. And these perspectives can and they will vary based on the region of a country that the treatment is being administered. So it's essential to understand that an ICER calculated from a cost effectiveness analysis performed from the perspective of the US healthcare system may not translate directly to the UK healthcare system because costs and reimbursements will be different. So once a time frame and perspective is decided upon and an ICER is calculated, it's then plotted on a cost effectiveness plane where costs are on the y-axis and health benefits are on the x-axis. Each quadrant of the cost effectiveness plane has a different implication. If your ICER falls in the top left corner, it means that the new intervention has fewer benefits and it costs more and it represents a treatment strategy failure on all counts. Conversely, if your ICER falls in the bottom right-hand corner, then the new intervention has greater benefits and it's cheaper. Interventions falling into this quadrant are always cost effective for the obvious reasons, and they're considered an economically dominant strategy. Now, it gets a little less clear about what to do with ICERs that fall into the remaining two quadrants. In the bottom left-hand corner, we have fewer benefits and less costs, while in the upper right-hand corner, we have more benefits and more costs. Now, technically, these quadrants are actually pretty equivalent in that they can both be cost effective, but the trade-offs have to be considered. In the case of most new technology being introduced into the medical arena, ICERs tend to fall into the more benefits, more cost quadrant because new things are often expensive. So the next question that arises is at what dollar cutoff do we consider an ICER to be a good value for the money? Or put another way, how much would you pay or should you pay for a quality gained? Well, the ACC and the HA, uh, with the help of the World Health Organization, have defined thresholds by which we can consider an intervention to be of good value or not to a healthcare system. In general, the World Health Organization suggested a rough benchmark of three times the GDP per capita as an upper threshold for an acceptable level of cost effectiveness in a given country, and a benchmark of one times the GDP as affordable or high value. So in 2011, the GDP per capita in the US was about $48,000, which implies that a cost effectiveness ratio of about 50,000 per quality would be considered to be economically attractive. In the same vein, an upper cost effectiveness or a willingness to pay threshold would be considered at about $150,000 per quality. 
treatments with cost effectiveness ratios above this range would generally be considered economically unattractive and of low, uh, low value. And then cost effectiveness ratios between 50K and 150K are considered of intermediate value. Willingness to pay thresholds vary across health systems. So in general, a willingness to pay threshold of $20,000 per quality is considered high economic value, while an ICER of over $100,000 per quality is considered lower economic value in Canada. So with that background, as uh, Dr. Courtney has already kind of referred to, um, I'd like to illustrate the power of cost effectiveness analyses uh, in defining uh, value for new technologies with a case example. And I chose TAVR. So TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement officially burst onto the medical stage in 2010 with the presentation of the results of the partner one trial at the transcatheter cardiovascular therapeutics national conference in Washington, DC. Now, while the technology to replace an aortic valve percutaneously had been under investigation for years, with the first TAVR actually being implanted in a human in 2002 by Dr. Cribier, the arrival of this technology to prime time was a huge development for the cardiology world. The first randomized control trial to officially evaluate TAVR was the PARTNER trial. In the PARTNER 1B cohort, 358 patients who had severe symptomatic aortic stenosis and they were deemed inoperable and unable to receive surgical AVR were randomized to receive either transfemoral TAVR or medical therapy. And then the patients were followed. So in this landmark study, TAVR was found to be markedly superior to medical therapy in terms of survival with a hazard ratio of 0.55. Moreover, patients felt better. This graph shows the mean Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire overall summary scores at baseline, one month, six months, and 12 months. Now, to just give you a little context for this instrument, a change of five, 10, and 20 points is considered to represent a small, moderate, and large clinical change. So at every time point, quality of life was rated significantly better with TAVR than medical therapy, and the difference was at least moderate to large. So the clinical results of the technology were staggering, but what is a cost? Well, as expected, the upfront cost for the TAVR procedure and the hospitalization was very costly, especially when you compare it to the zero initial cost of medical therapy. And so TAVR started off almost $80,000 in the hole. But that initial investment paid off down the line. Uh, in the first year after the procedure, patients who were treated with medical therapy used over $24,000 of healthcare uh, resources, mostly in the form of increased rehospitalizations. And so when initial and follow-up costs were added together over the year for both groups, TAVR ended up costing about $53,000 more than medical therapy. Now, when these in-trial costs and benefits were projected over a lifetime horizon, TAVR was estimated to provide an increase of 1.3 quality adjusted life years uh, over medical therapy in the inoperable patient population at a cost of just under $80,000. And this results in an ICER of $61,889 per quality gained. So when the ICER is plotted in the cost effectiveness plane, we can see that it falls into that upper right-hand corner of more benefits, but also more costs. Bootstrap simulation was performed 5,000 times, and that's what's shown in that cluster of yellow dots. Um, and it demonstrated that the ICER was pretty stable about two thirds of replicates fall between, fell, uh, fell between the $50,000 and $100,000 willingness to pay threshold, and the remaining third fell below the $50,000 threshold. So overall, these are relatively favorable results for TAVR, and we learned a few things too. First, this analysis highlighted the importance of considering the longer term costs and benefits of an intervention. So if this analysis had been done looking at only the in-trial period, then the cost would have been much higher due to the initial upfront cost of the TAVR procedure, and the benefits accrued would have been lower since the accounting of full mortality and quality of life benefit would have been cut short. So in fact, when we did an in-trial ICER for this analysis, it was calculated to be about $145,000 per quality gain, so bordering on low value. Secondly, this analysis clearly demonstrates that being cost effective doesn't necessarily equate to being cost saving. And that's demonstrated on the cost effectiveness plane, but why is that? So in the case of TAVR, follow-up costs were considerably lower than with medical therapy. Um, so one would have expected there might've been some catch-up. 
But in this scenario, mortality rates were significantly better with TAVR, but they were still pretty high in both cohorts. Uh, by two years, 60% of the medical therapy patients had died compared to about 35% of the TAVR patients. And they were sick patients. The ones who were still alive, they utilized a fair amount of healthcare resources. So you have to remember that the benefit of prolonging life often comes at the cost of more resource utilization. So with the success of TAVR in the inoperable population, the story continued. And analyses were performed looking at comparing TAVR to surgical ADR in patients of varying, uh, and varying surgical risk. Shown here is the cost effectiveness um, analysis of TAVR versus SAVR in patients at very high surgical risk. And this demonstrated an ICER of intermediate value. In the high risk population, value increased and the ICER was calculated to be just over $55,000 per quality gained. And then most recently in the intermediate risk population, TAVR was projected to be economically dominant over surgical AVR. So the value of TAVR compared with surgical AVR has continued to improve steadily over time. Why? Well, one of the biggest contributor, contributors is related to the patient population. It, it's the lower and lower risks are being, uh, patients were being compared. These patients have less comorbidities and so they tend to utilize healthcare resources less. But it isn't just about the patient populations. The initial cost effectiveness analyses allowed us to identify some of the cost drivers for the TAVR procedure and then innovation stepped in to address them. So first, TAVR is most commonly performed via a transfemoral approach through the groin. However, in patients who have significant peripheral arterial disease, transfemoral approach is sometimes not an option due to the large sheath size that's required to deliver the valve implant. Cost effectiveness analyses have consistently shown that a non-transfemoral approach is of poorer economic value than a transfemoral approach. So how do we address this? Well, the initial delivery sheets for the TAVR device were on the order of 22 to 24 French, which is very large. And in the initial trials, almost a third of patients didn't have the femoral vasculature to accommodate such a large sheath. And so the valve was delivered through an alternative approach, which initially was shown to have little benefit when compared to surgical AVR. So innovators worked to redesign the implant delivery system such that the TAVR valve is now currently generally implanted through a 14 to 16 French sheath. This has resulted in the percentage of transfemoral TAVR increasing exponentially and transthoracic TAVR is becoming very much the anomaly in the current era. Additionally, periprocedural complications after TAVR were identified as a significant component to length of stay, as well as to the cost of the index hospitalization. This graph shows the contribution of complications to cost, that's shaded in green, to the index hospitalization in the partner one data set on the left and the core valve extreme risk cohort on the right and what you can see is that in both data sets, complications account for about a quarter of the non-valve implant related costs of an index hospitalization. Now, when we look at individual complications, things like bleeding, need for permanent pacemaker after the procedure or major stroke, you can see that each of these incremental costs um, for these complications is not insignificant. And so it follows that if we can decrease these complications with technological advances, then that should result in decreased costs for the TAVR index hospitalization. Bleeding is a significant complication after TAVR and was seen in rates of up to 10% in the initial partner 1A trial. But as we already talked about, this was the first generation device, which was initially delivered through that large 22 to 24 front sheath and created a huge hole in the femoral artery. So it would follow that, follow that smaller vascular access from smaller sheaths should lead to a lower rate of bleeding. The need for pacemaker implantation after TAVR is well known and it relates to the fact that patients can develop heart block after TAVR due to pressure of the implant in the left ventricular outflow tract, which can then lead to disruption of the bundle branches. Now studies have found that the deeper the implant into the LVOT, the higher the rate of conduction system disruption. So being able to recapture and reposition a device that's placed too low can decrease the rates of post-procedure pacemaker insertion. And lastly, efforts have been made to decrease stroke rates, one of the most feared complications of TAVR. Smaller, more maneuverable devices have been developed with the idea that there's less disruption and embolization of aortic plaque with advancement of the device through the aortic arch. And scientists have also come up with cerebral embolic protection devices that can catch plaque or calcium from the valve before it reaches the cerebral circulation. 
And as hoped, these technological advances have surely contributed to the decrease in periprocedural complication rates over time. And this has been an effect on the changes in index hospitalization costs associated with TAVR over time as well. The majority of what you can see here is, is, this, um, is isolated to decreasing non-procedural related costs that are shown in red. Now, this is reflective of a variety of factors, including, again, the lower and lower risk populations in which the procedure is being performed in, but it's likely that the decreasing rates of complications, as well as the increased use of the transfemoral approach, likely contributed to shorter lengths of stay in the hospital post-procedure with resulting decreasing costs. Now, this is important in any healthcare system, although in the US healthcare system where reimbursement to a hospital is generally fixed based on an assigned MSDRG code, um, you can see here that the base rate for a TAVR hospitalization is around $44,000. Now, this number gets adjusted up and down for wage index and other add-ons, um, but due to the high cost of the TAVR device itself, much of this reimbursement is going to be eaten up by the procedural cost. So the main way to improve the economic value of this procedure to an individual hospital and thus encourage that hospital to adopt a new technology such as TAVR that's costly in the short term but beneficial down the road is to rely on technological advances in the development of care pathways that will shorten length of stay and the costs associated with the post-procedural course. I'd like to finish up then with a couple of slides about social value analyses. Traditional cost effectiveness analyses assess technology through the eyes of the patient and the healthcare system. Social value analyses act to complement cost effectiveness analyses by taking into account the value that the technology brings to all of society, including the innovators and the manufacturers of a new drug or device. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, by understanding the role that a new treatment strategy will play for patients, the healthcare system and the economy alike uh, can inform public policy decisions regarding reimbursement. Secondly, social value analyses provide quantification of the return investment for manufacturers. Since many of these inventions require large startup costs, there needs to be an adequate profit down the road to incentivize future innovation. So shown here is a social value analysis that was done looking at the use of TAVR in inoperable patients in the US. TAVR was projected to offer over 600,000 qualities to society between 2018 and 2028 at a cumulative social benefit of $46.7 billion. Now, when we broke that number down by the percentage that went to patients and payers versus what was accrued to the manufacturer of the TAVR implant, you can see about 80% went to patients. The remaining 20% or about 9.4 billion is projected to go to manufacturers. Now this ratio is in keeping with many other medical uh, innovations and it's likely sufficient for the promotion of continued technological development. So in summary then, understanding the short and long-term value of a medical innovation is essential for widespread adoption. Cost effectiveness analyses allow for the formal evaluation of the value of a new technology to the patient and the healthcare system, while also permitting the identification of areas for potential cost-lowering strategies. Social value analyses complement cost effectiveness analyses by quantifying value for all stakeholders and thereby acting to inform public policy. And by utilizing these types of analytic tools, we can ensure medical technology continues to advance and that innovation doesn't become stifled by being penny wise, but pound foolish. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. That's a great, uh, um great uh, presentation on uh, cost effectiveness and uh, how uh, how it gets uh, calculated and and, and um, how it uh, can uh, be used what the thresholds are uh, for uh, decision makers and uh, uh, you know the fact that you're a practicing physician doing these procedures I'm, uh, I'm sure has also been incredibly helpful in terms of giving you insights as to how do you truly quantify or identify um, you know the real benefits uh, of the procedure um, it's 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 not it's not purely an Excel spreadsheet and someone sitting down putting assumptions together. It's, it really needs to have people who uh, understand um, the hospital uh, environment, uh, the procedural context, the complications, and then the impact on the patients in the long term. So having you do this kind of work is incredibly helpful and thank you for that. Um, are there, uh, two of our speakers had to, had to leave, unfortunately, when you invite the CEO of a hospital and the president of the Ontario Medical Association. Um, uh, Suzanne, all the questions are going to come to you. So uh, uh, I've got a few and I'm curious if maybe um, before uh, I start putting
putting questions on. If any of the panelists have questions, and I'll keep an eye out on the Q&A form as well uh, for some questions uh, for Suzanne. Maybe I'll start with this one. Um, you know, I read an interesting uh, uh, um, article that, that you were involved with around uh, the um, cost effectiveness of a drug that is out there on the market for amyloidosis in the cardiac space. And just to give people a little bit of a background here, you saw Dr. Barron's slides in Canada, maybe a, a very cost effective therapy is $20,000 per quality adjusted life year. And in the United States, it's, it's $50,000. Um, I think it's probably a little bit extreme. It's probably they're probably a bit closer to each other than that. Um, but um, uh, if you uh, there are some drugs that come out on the market now for what are called orphan applications, and and um, uh, and uh, Tony Cruz mentioned uh, this is an area that investors like to get into. Um, there is a drug uh, series of drugs. There's about three or four of them out there now for treating a rare condition called cardiac amyloidosis. And if you go to a cardiology meeting right now, there will be presentations about this and there will be meals provided to the attendees, which uh, is increasingly being frowned upon. Um, and then if, and you find out that this, hey, this great drug is now able to treat a rare condition far more effectively in an area where there was no solution. And people get excited about the fact that it provides a benefit. It does improve, um, it probably uh, extends people's uh, livelihoods with uh, this condition um, by uh, several months, um, if not uh, years. But it costs twenty to thirty thousand dollars per month to take this drug, and that amounts to a quarter million dollars per year for the drug. And when it really only benefits six, seven, eight, one out of every six, seven or eight patients, let's say the number needed to treat is eight, then you're talking about $2 million per quality adjusted life year. So uh, Suzanne, you know, where does that fit in? And maybe this is a broader discussion about how um, cost effectiveness for drugs is determined versus devices. And I think it's, it's definitely a broader discussion, um, but I think part of what it goes to is what we're kind of getting at is what's the application to the patient population? How broad is that patient population that it's going to treat? And usually that should somewhat yeah. inform how things are priced. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when amyloid, the, when famidus, what we're talking about was, was being approved, it went under that orphan drug application, suggesting that it's not, that amyloid is not that common of a, of a, um, of a condition. And I think what we're all seeing from a cardiology perspective is now that we're looking for it more and more, we're finding it all the time and there's new scans to identify it and now we have a treatment for it. Um, however, when it went through the orphan drug application, the thought was, oh, it's only going to be used to treat a few people. Um, and so, again, I can't speak for the company, but I'm sure that they put a lot of money into developing this drug and then said, well, it's not going to be able to treat that many people. And so we're going to have to make sure that the price is really high so we can recoup some of our investment uh, into this drug. Well, now the issue is there's a lot of people out there who could possibly benefit from it. Um, and given that, you've now got a lot of people could possibly benefit from it with a hugely high price tag. And so patients, frankly, are having a lot of trouble getting it. I, I don't want to speak for your practice, um, but I've certainly had patients that I've had to jump through a lot of hoops to try to get insurance companies to cover it. And even then it's, you know, ends up with very high copay and patients just can't afford it. Um, and so there's been some, I think, appropriate backlash about saying, is this truly a drug that should have gone under the orphan drug um, codicil or should this have been something that was approved through a different situation and then maybe been more appropriately priced out. Um, but I think what it really comes down to or how you kind of can tie it into both drugs and devices really is what's the patient population that you're aiming to treat. Um, and based on that, that kind of determines, you know, how much investment you're going to need to put into the innovation and into the, um, into the, uh, the research and the development into it. Uh, and then how much you think you're going to reap back and then that determines your price. It's an interesting paradox that things that are more commonly going to be uh, applied to broader patient populations are going to be scrutinized more heavily um, as opposed to uh, some other uh, device uh, technologies, whether it's a drug or a device that's for smaller patient populations. 
Um, there was a question that came in on the Q&A uh, just about how to um, best quantify the social value of a therapy and should it be done during a health technology assessment. So, you know, I can tell you when you're doing social value, you generally need to have a sense of what the costs of the, of the, the costs and the benefits of the, um, uh, the costs and the benefits of the uh, device are going to be. Um, and so you usually can't necessarily know that until you've got your randomized control trial that's been done or your, you know, your data that's come from that device. Um, and then from there, you can make your assumptions and model off. Um, you know, I can certainly say that, you know, when we were doing the social value analysis for an operable tavern, the things that needed to be taken into account was what is the prevalence of aortic stenosis? What do we think the patient, how many of those patients are inoperable? Who's going to be treated? Who's, who's going to actually go for treated versus not actually be treating? And then of those patients, what sort of benefits are they going to get, i.e. how many qualities, and then what's the cost going to be? So I think it's hard to do a social value analysis at the exact same time as a cost effectiveness analysis, but usually you can do one relatively soon afterwards. Thank you. And Brad, you had a, a question. Uh, did you want to uh, uh, communicate that question directly, or would you like me to do it for you, Brad? Uh, go ahead, Brian. You can do it. Uh, he was just, um, uh, he had two questions. Um, one was uh, that if the, if the reimbursement is still um, less than the cost of the TAVI hospitalized, it was less than the um, cost of the TAVI hospitalization, um, are hospitals accepting a loss on TAVIs uh, despite the long-term savings or are they able to, to make it profitable at this point? So upfront, it's a, I mean, it's a great question. So yeah, upfront, there was a huge issue about you know, our, our hospital is going to be lost. Now, depending on where, uh, one, again, and I, with, with the U.S., because of the adjustment for the wage index, for example, cost of living is a lot higher on the coasts, and so that reimbursement is actually a lot higher. So the hospitals that were really getting hit by that actually were in the Midwest um, or places with lower, lower wage index. And there was a question of, can we afford to actually have these types of programs because we're going to take a loss? You know, there was a couple things I think that, have encouraged programs to um, adopt TAVR more in the US. One is their halo effect, um, and that wasn't something that really was um, quantified in the official cost effectiveness analyses, but what that refers to is all of the um, ancillary testing that the hospital is going to reap the benefits from. Every patient who gets a TAVR also gets a cardiac catheterization, they get a CT scan, they get an echocardiogram, they get follow-up echocardiograms. And so there's that halo effect of future testing down the road, which isn't incorporated into just that one index hospitalization reimbursement. That's one. Two, um, because TAVRs aren't offered at every hospital, because it does require a certain amount of, you know, you need to have a CT surgeon, you need to have the, um, the equipment, you need to have um, essentially, you know, the ability to, to manage this program, which requires, you know, valve coordinators and clinics and, you know, a fair amount of resources to do it. Um, you know, it, not every hospital uh, could have it. And so in that setting, it was used, just having that program was used as kind of a referral source and a reason to kind of excite people to say, hey, send your patient here. They might get the newest, the brightest, the best new technology. Um, so it was used as kind of a way to increase um, increase uh, uh, referrals, you know, with the costs um, of TAVR coming down and, and actually, um, you know, people have, I presented some of the very early data, you know, there's a lot of data out there now with improved care pathways. Um, patients are going home next day after their TAVR. In fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, David Wood and Sandra Locke, you know, kind of spearheaded the whole 3M Vancouver pathway um, to actually have a protocol for sending patients home the next day. Tower is becoming more and more profitable from that perspective, or at least not quite as much of a, of a loss. Um, and that has allowed the, um, the technology to spread to more and more hospitals. Um, well, I'm, we're really appreciative of your uh, time uh, joining us uh, here today. And um, uh, given uh, where we are in the schedule, I think it might be an appropriate time for me to help us move along uh, to the next part. But uh, a pleasure to have you here and uh, thank you very much.